again, the same questions I've asked here, that it's a different world before Islam and it's a different world after Islam. And this is where uh, we understand that what was happening in the Muslim world was extraordinary. It cannot be overlooked. It is an important link to understand our world today. So ways in which the Quran influenced. Now, this is the important question, and this is the most important thing to understand because we're gonna be using this to talk about how can we now, you know, replicate this? How can we now move towards a second golden age when we understand what's the Quran? Because you see, we don't have the Islamic scientific revolution. We don't have the golden age. We don't have those people. We hardly have a few manuscripts and then we have some knowledge on that. So essentially, how can we replicate something which is so, and the world has changed so much. How do you replicate that, which has, you know, which is far in the past? The only way we can do that is because we have something which they had and which is the Quran. And now we're going to see how the Quran influenced their greatness. So it provided the initial impetus. We're going to see that. The Tawhidic philosophy of science, the philosophy of science that was used was Tawhid. I mean, we think of Tawhid as something we read, you know, la ilaha illallah, we do our zikr and stuff, but we would never think how can the philosophy of science be, you know, utilized something as religious as Tawheed. And then the practical needs of the Ummah, the Ummah needed science. You, the Ummah needed science to improve its religious experience. And so we go to how uh, the Quran demands producing this demonstrable proof. This kind of, this idea of a scientific mindset was created in the Medina society, wherein the, this idea of always validating the truth was present. So whether you're saying whether this truth belongs to any domain, you know, the religious sciences or the rational sciences or the spiritual sciences, how do you validate it? So Muslims were always obsessed with this idea of finding the Burhan. And you see this word Burhan, if uh, most of us have read the Quran and the other name of the Quran is Burhan. And uh, this word Burhan means demonstrable proof. We can see this mentioned in the scientific text as well as the philosophical text. That tells you how central the Quran was to their uh, education, to their understanding. Then, like I said, question the free will. It was, you know, history, time itself forced Muslims to develop science. And the inductive method that I just described right now, it was first used which is very uh, interesting. The first use of this inductive method was in the codification of the of uh, Islamic jurisprudence, fiqh. So they actually, the fuqaha used the scientific method. And which is so amazing that our religious sciences are as rigorous and as objective as our physical sciences and even spiritual sciences for that matter. It's, uh, it's a lovely quote from uh, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. He says that uh, consider, how can I, okay, uh, the things which relate our past to our future. One such link is the inductive method. He talks about this, the inductive method, which has been applied to modern sciences now. It's a blessing bestowed to the world by the Holy Quran. So he's one of the few people in the modern uh, era who recognize that there you have it, the inductive kind of reasoning where you go from the unknown to the known. You make a conclusion about these are the known facts and now I can infer the unknown from there. This is actually from the Quran because that's how we come to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, he says, the results and fruits of the inductive method are quite apparent today. That's the scientific revolution, right? So all uh, branches of knowledge evolved now in the same intellectual milieu that I was talking about. Abu Zafar Iqbal, he says that uh, the religious sciences provided the intellectual context and some elements of the methodology that was later used by natural sciences. Again, echoing the same idea that you had first, the religious sciences being built and the same methodology being used to develop the physical sciences. And which is very interesting. You know why I'm mentioning all of this? Primarily is because all of us right now here, we know that science is presented as 
a challenge to the religious way of life. Uh, most, the biggest and the most notorious of atheists are scientists. And they say, we don't need religion. We have science and science can be proved. Religion can't be proved and all of that. You know. But when we go to the Islamic world, we actually see that not only are the people who are developing the science scholars, uh, religious scholars, fuqaha, ulama, but they're actually using the same methods that they use for their religious sciences in uh, building uh, physical sciences. That's, that's fascinating. What that tells us, and inshallah we can be speaking about that before, is that that means we can replicate that. That means a uh, sophisticated or a scientifically you know, inundated society like ours can also be a very religious and spiritual society. We can see that from our past. So the same adherence to truth and objectivity, a respect for the corroborated empirical evidence, an eye for detail, refined taste for proper categorization and classification of data, they use the same methods for fiqh, for hadith sciences, for usul, and then for physics, biology, uh, bi uh, you know, uh, chemistry, and all of that. 